Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have a Turno automatic watch from the late 50s, it seems. And this one is something that I've been getting into a little bit more lately, which is working on watches for other people. And this one is for a friend of mine. And uh, this was actually his grandmother's watch. They found it in a drawer after she passed away in 2020. And they think that this might have been the watch that her parents gave to her for her wedding, which would have been in the, in the mid to late 50s. Now, this thing needs some work. As you can see, it has been neglected. It has a huge crack and, in fact, a whole hole right on the front. And it's in pretty beat up shape. Now... When you're working on somebody else's watch, you always have to be very clear with them about what they want fixed and what they want not fixed. So I have a plan in place for this watch for my friend and we're gonna see what's going on with it. Now, as you can see, it is actually running, but it'll stop and it kind of keeps stopping and it won't work. The other thing that you'll notice right away is that this is an automatic watch, but look at this. It's got a bumper movement in it. So normally we would see a, rot a rotor that would spin freely in a full 360 degree fashion. But before those were invented, you would actually find movements like this, which is a bumper, which means that the rotor just goes back and forth and bounces off of those springs and winds the watch as it goes. So I've never worked on a bumper movement before, but uh, there's always a first time for everything, I suppose. And frankly, I'm kind of excited about it because uh, I know how these work fundamentally. I don't think they're that much different and I think I can, uh, can dive right in. So of course, first thing we need to do is uh, take the watch out of the case and get this crystal at it. Look at this. And as you can see, the dial has accumulated a fair amount of dirt and even some wear as a result of that hole in the crystal. I mean, that's just what happens when it gets exposed to the elements. And uh, I am gonna take a stab at, at the dial as well. The plan is to clean it up a little bit. Um, I find that if you try to do anything more than that on dials, you ruin the watch, basically. If, uh, every time I've seen a relumed dial, it's been terrible. Every time I've seen a repainted dial, it's been terrible. And uh, it's certainly well beyond my skill set to be able to do so. I'm gonna quickly measure this crystal. It's a little bit of a weird crystal and uh, I need to get the measurements for it so that I can send away for a new one because clearly this watch needs a new crystal. So now that I've got that measurement, I can uh, proceed with disassembling the watch and kind of seeing what we're looking at. Again, the watch will run, but it just keeps stopping. So clearly it's in need of a service. Uh, it looks like it hasn't been serviced in years and years. So we'll start by doing that and, and see if that fixes the problem for us. The rest of the stuff is cosmetic. Uh, I did, I talked to the owner about the case and the hands because it looks like this watch had loom on the hands at some point, but it's gone. Um, and also the case is, is pretty beat up. You know, it's, it's, it's had a long life. And uh, he said, you know what? I'd rather keep the case honest and how it is. I don't need to, to polish that up. So that's kind of how I prefer to do things anyway. And um, when it comes to the hands, he said, you know, I don't mind them without the loom. So I want to leave them empty like that too. So that's what we'll be doing for this one. Our biggest chore here is to make sure that this thing runs again so that it can be enjoyed by a family member um, and, you know, just to have it running and then also to get this dial back in decent shape because it really is kind of ruining the look of the watch having dirt all over it. And we'll see what we can do. Overall, the dial's actually in decent shape. Besides that, the loom seems to be in place on the numerals and the print is all there. The watch, uh, again, is a Turno brand, which, you know, you might recognize that brand because they're actually a watch retailer now, um, where they will, if you find a Turno shop, they'll usually have multiple boutiques from different manufacturers. But uh, it seems that they also had some, some watches made back in the day as well, so under their own brand. And usually the way that this would work is that if you were a watch retailer and you wanted to have your own watches made, you would contract that out to a Swiss company to make them for you. And there's numerous Swiss companies that did this. And that seems to be the case here. In fact, there's a video that I did on the channel of a tradition watch, which is uh, which was Sears and Roebuck's brand of watches, but they had um, Hoyer out of Switzerland make those for them. 
Okay, so now that we got the, the rotor off and the balance off, we can start to dig around and get the automatic winding works free here. So that's this part right here. This bridge goes over the winding works and I don't really know how it works just yet, but we'll figure it out. The first thing this, whoa, that jumped. And the first thing that jumps to mind is this part here with this almost impossibly thin spring attached. I mean, it looks like a hair and it's actually a spring. So, okay, we have to be extremely careful with that. That does not seem like a robust design to me. Uh, and it's something that we're gonna have to really be touchy with because if we bend that, I don't know how we're gonna fix it. But as you can see, the wheels for the automatic works come off and then we can also take out this, this center pinion here. That's what powers the center seconds. And this wheel attaches to the fourth wheel, and so we need to take it off. It's an extended wheel. And I've got a special tool that does that. And now we can take off the train wheel bridge. And you know what, that could look a lot worse. Uh, this this thing doesn't look like it's been serviced in forever, but it also doesn't look like it's been worn very much in a long time. It's definitely seen wear, no doubt about that, but it doesn't look like it has recently. It was probably in my friend's grandma's drawer for years and years and years. You know, a lot of times when a crystal breaks on a watch, people don't know how to go get it repaired or don't get around to it, but they also know I shouldn't wear the watch with it like that, so it'll just sit. Okay, we can take the crown wheel off now. I already got the ratchet wheel off. But you can see they're kind of obstructing the rest of the train of wheels, so I'm gonna have to do that. And the center wheel can come free. A little sticky, there's probably some leftover oil hanging out on here. Okay, with the train wheel out, we can uh, continue with disassembling the barrel bridge. You can see those big springs on the sides there for the bumper movement. The rotor is considered a, the free winding rotor is considered a much better design for a couple of reasons. One of them is efficiency. It just has more room to travel so it charges up the watch faster. But also, uh, bumper movements are very heavy and they hit up against those springs. And if, if they're not well balanced, you can feel them on your wrist. You, you can actually feel it hit. It's kind of funny. All right, apart comes the keyless works. And I'm not sure if this these posts are supposed to come off or not. I don't think it really matters. They're not lubricated or anything like that. But again, my first time working on a watch like this, so I'm not 100% sure. It's kind of part of the fun of doing it the way I do it, where I'm often working on different watches. But I will say there is a lot of satisfaction to coming back to the same movement and kind of understanding its little little differences and the little hiccups and <laughs> traps that they have kind of gives you that feeling of like, I'm really getting this where when you're constantly working on new stuff, you're just always learning, always absorbing. I think there's benefits to both. Okay. Let's just flip this thing over so we can finish the disassembly. We're almost done. The keyless works needs to come apart, but we have to be careful here with the uh, springs. Oop. Oop, there it is, drop the screws. That's for the setting lever spring, which I'm taking out now. And there's the intermediate wheel. So that leaves the yoke, the yoke spring, and the setting lever itself.
So I'm gonna flip the movement over and take off the longest setting lever screw I've ever seen. <laughs> it's really long. And now I can take out the yoke. And I think we can call it good there. So now I can put the movement, excuse me, I can put the balance back on the movement just for safekeeping while the movement goes through the, uh, the watch cleaning machine. Okay, so now things are set to go into the watch cleaning machine, which um, it has four stages. The, the first one is cleaning, and then the next two are rinse, and then the last one is drying. And while I uh, put this particular movement through the motions there, I did want to mention that I have a Patreon for this channel. So if you like what I'm doing here and you want to support me, you can head over to patreon.com slash wristwatch revival and you get a thank you card as well as a wristwatch revival sticker in the mail, no matter what level you're at. And you get access to some cool stuff, early looks, um, you get the rough cuts of the videos before they come out, that type of stuff. And I wanted to extend it uh, thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon, but particularly Trevor, Seth, Ross, uh, Robert, Mitchell, Mikey, Kevin, James, George, Erica, Dustin, Brinton, Brian, Brian, Brett, Brad, and Alex for their support. Thank you so much. It really does mean the world to me. Uh, I love making these videos for you, but as you might imagine, they're very resource and time intensive. And so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, uh, <laughs> to make it a real thing if I can. So, that's the cleaning solution, and now we get to put it into the rinse. And then a second rinse. And then finally we put it into the heated dry. It turns really slowly in there, but it makes sure that the parts are completely dry. And now that that's done, we can uh, take the basket back off of the machine and take a look at the clean parts. Careful, the basket's hot. Okay, so here's the parts all cleaned up and ready to go. That's the entire watch completely disassembled and ready for reassembly. Looks nice, doesn't it? Okay, so as we get going here, we can start off with the train of wheels. So I'll start off with the escape wheel. And we'll move our way up the train. These are kind of the core fundamental parts of the watch, the train of wheels. And now we need to get this uh, train bridge over. And this is a little bit tricky because this does have pivots for three, actually four of the train wheels here. In fact, all of them. And there we go. So that actually went on pretty easily. Um, I'll actually use this red stick to just stabilize the bridge because if you start screwing down the bridge screws and one of the pivots isn't in place, you can break them or bend them. So you always wanna be very careful with this part as those pivots are so small that it wouldn't take much to, to break one. And just a quick check to make sure that they're spinning and there looks pretty good there. So now we can get going with the uh, barrel. We'll put it back together and get the barrel arbor in place. This is the mainspring. And the barrel and the lid and the arbor. Those are the four parts that make up a barrel complete. And now I can put that into the movement. As well as the seconds, the center seconds pinion here and this little springy thing that kind of keeps it in place. It's got a very, very small screw that holds it down. 
And there we go. Now I'm gonna put the setting lever screw into place here with a little bit of HP 1300 around the edge. And now I can continue the rebuild here with the barrel bridge. This one's a lot easier to put on because there's only two pivots that it needs to hit. Okay. Now I'm just going to put a little bit of oil around the barrel arbor point where it connects up because this part's gonna get covered up pretty soon and I won't have access to it anymore. And as we continue our little project here, we can put the crown wheel on with its two little tiny screws, but it looks like it's spinning freely, so that works. And that means that the ratchet wheel can go in place. Make sure that that's engaged properly and uh, that should be good to go. Now I need to do a little bit of oiling here. This is Mobius 9010 going on the train wheel jewels. Requires a very, very, very small amount to be properly oiled. And now I can put that extended center seconds wheel on and make sure that it's engaged. And it looks like it is. Okay, now it gets a little tricky because we need to put this automatic winding works back together, but I haven't really worked on one quite like this before. And again, the, these two gears seem to really make sense. They mesh with each other and one of them meshes with the barrel itself. So that makes sense on how that would turn it. But boy, this little thing, this, this click spring, th this is a click actually, but it has this unbelievably thin spring attached to the end of it. It's almost hard to see it so thin. And I want to make sure that it gets seated right and doesn't get bent. There we go. You can see it provides a little bit of tension there. And then there's that bridge here, this kind of top plate that we need to, to use to tie everything together. Also has a kind of a weird setup here. There's a very, very long screw that kind of holds the base down and then there's a much shorter one that holds the other side. You don't see that really on newer watches. And this watch is actually quite thick. And that's a part of the function here of the automatic winding works. I kind of like that this one's thick because it gives a little bit more presence. It's quite a small watch on the wrist. Okay, so now we can flip it over and start reassembling from the other side. We'll start with putting the cannon pinion on. And it goes on just like that. And then we can continue with the keyless works. This is called the clutch wheel. And then the sliding clutch will go on behind it. This is a nice little movement. 
You can see those circles all over the base. Decorative. They don't they don't serve any function. They're just there to look cool. And they do. Okay, we can put this intermediate wheel back on. This is part of the motion works, which is what sets the hands on your watch. And that is the hour wheel, so that's actually what what turns that particular hand a certain amount of times per hour, in this case, once. And now the winding stem can go back in once we put a little bit of grease on it. Okay, and now we need to put the yoke and the yoke spring in. So once again, we're just putting some oil in place to make sure that uh, there's no undue friction there. Pretty important on these parts. They're, they're quite high friction area. All right, that looks right. We've got the setting lever in place. And the last thing to put in here for the keyless works is the yoke spring and the setting lever spring. And these are finicky. Uh, you have to be very careful with these. They're, they're prone to fly, let's just say. <laughs> they were born for the air. And so you have to be careful. And the last thing is the setting lever spring. It has two screws that hold it down. And then we just see a little bit of grease where the setting lever spring engages with the setting lever because it actually just slides across the metal there. So a little bit of grease does a few things. Uh, for one thing it does, it just makes it perform better because it's, it's easier to, to pull in and out. So that's nice. But also it makes it so that there isn't an accumulation of tiny pieces of metal from that thing rubbing off over time. And those can really get into the into the watch and, and stop it in its tracks. It can even cause damage to the pivots and such. So it's pretty important, especially on those high friction areas that you use some grease there. Okay, now we can put the pallet fork in and the pallet fork bridge, which is being a little finicky here, but there we go. I'm gonna use this red stick just to hold it in place for the same reasons as before. Okay, so the pallet fork's in place, and we can give the watch a wind and see if this thing's going to run for us. Now, like I said, it was intermittently running before, um, but it kept stopping. And so if we can get it to run consistently, well, that's job number one. And then, of course, we have the cosmetic stuff to take care of as well. But this is first things first. So let's make sure that we can get this thing to run. Okay. Do you want to run? You do want to, oh, you do want to run? Kind of going and stopping, not really sure why. Oh, there we go. Needed a little bit of a kickstart, but now it's running really well. Perfect. Okay, so that's great news. Now we're gonna to have to see if it'll continue to run, but uh, the fact that it looks like it's running pretty strong is definitely what we wanted to see. So we'll give it a nice full wind, and that'll let the oils kind of set in and let the watch kind of find its rhythm. And we still have some work to do on the movement as well because of course there's the cap jewels that need to be oiled. So these are for the balance itself, and uh, as you can see, we just need to simply remove this little spring, which is, well, I'm on a microscope here, just to, <laughs> it is a very finicky job. And there we go, then we can take out the jewel setting, which is actually comprised of both the cap jewel and the setting itself. I put oil, clean it and put oil in between. And you can see a nice circle of oil there in the middle of that jewel, if you can see it. And that suspends that oil right where that pivot is and helps the watch run better and for longer. Now we need to simply replace this spring and make sure that it is, uh, seated properly. 
The spring holds that whole setting in place, but also provides it some flexibility in the case that the watch gets dropped. And uh, that was relatively new when this watch came out. It, In fact, they advertise it on the front of the dial. It says shock absorber. And that's what that is. That actually solved a problem that was really prevalent with watches going back to pocket watch days, which was that if you dropped it, there was a darn good chance that you would break the balance pivot. That happened all the time. People, I mean, that's what most of the repairs were, were just replacing the balance staff on a watch because it was so vulnerable to shock. And I mean shock like being dropped or even bumped really hard. But after they came out with these shock systems, these little brass springs that you put on the top and bottom, that problem went away for the most part. It still exists. I mean, you can still break a pivot if you hit it hard enough, but you really need to slam it now. And uh, before, it really didn't take much at all. Okay, well, this is the bottom. And uh, (laughs) I seem to have missed a little bit here, but let's just (laughs) gently urge this cap jewel into place. And there we go. That's what we wanted to see. And then once again, I can replace the spring back to its position. It's always a little finicky with these, and I find it's just easier to turn the whole entire movement around. And that way I can actually pull across the spring and get it into place, and it's much easier than trying to push it. There we go. Everything set into place and looking good. Now there's a few more uh, jewels that I need to oil here on the bottom, so I may as well get those while I have the thing on the microscope anyway. And uh, with that done, We can put this thing on the time grapher and see how it does. After some tweaking, some regulation, it's looking good. Yeah, I have to be happy with this. Only minus three, minus four seconds a day. The beat error is a bit off, but this doesn't have a beat error corrector. And I find that it's actually not worth it on these ones uh, to correct beat error of this level. And my reasoning is, is that you expose the hairspring to damage by doing so and it doesn't affect the timekeeping of the watch directly so i'm inclined to not do that okay so now we got to shift our focus to the cosmetics on this watch so primarily it's the watch dial now this is a very very touchy thing to do so i'm using only water and a very soft uh kind of a swab here to try to remove some of the extraneous dirt that's hanging around as a result of that crystal having been broken. But I have to be very careful because I want to to bring back this dial to life, but you know, it's really easy to knock off some of that print and then, you know, then it's not even necessarily better than if it was dirty. So I'm going to be very very careful use very light strokes on this as well as a few different sizes of swabs. I've got small ones here to kind of get into the crevices. And I'm going to try to gently remove as much of this dirt as possible to get this dial looking as good as I can without damaging it. You can see on the dial where it says shock absorber. You know, they were really, really into that. If you've ever seen the words Inca block on a watch and wondered what that, why does it say that on the front? That's the name of the shock setting type that is in fact on this watch as well. There's four or maybe five different methods that people use. They all accomplish the same goal and Inca block is the most popular. And so if you ever see that and you've wondered, is that the brand name? What is that even referring to? It's it's referring to the fact that it uses the Inca block shock setting system to prevent, you know, shocks from damaging it. So I'm just going to speed things up a little bit here because this is slow going. This is not the kind of thing that you can just get in there and start scrubbing away. You really do have to get into the crevices and be as careful as you can because if you start to see any of the the text or anything start to degrade, you have to basically stop and can't do it. But take a look. It actually came out pretty good. Uh, You know, really most of the dirt came off and there's a usable dial under here that looks much better. You can read it better and... uh, I'm actually quite happy with that. Now, I'm not going to push my luck and do any more. <laughs> so that's going to be it for that. Now, the crystal needs to be replaced, but this is a different type of crystal. It sits underneath the case 
and in between it and the big case ring that you see underneath. So it kind of has like a flange that goes around the bottom. So I had to get a different type of crystal that would fit in there and then go underneath. So that's what I did. I found one and uh, put the new crystal in, but it doesn't actually sit securely. Like it's not the type that, that you have to fit in there. It just sort of sits underneath and gets sandwiched. So we can put the hour wheel on as well as the all important little dial washer to make sure that the hour and minute wheels stay in alignment. And let's get the dial put back on the watch now. There we go, looks pretty good. Certainly looks better than before. And of course that means we can put the watch hands on. Now, as I mentioned before, the owner decided that they didn't want any loom to be put in the hands. Now I could have done that and I would have made the loom darker. Uh, you know, it wouldn't have been white because you want it to match the loom on the numerals as best you can. But again, the owner decided, you know what? I don't think it looks too bad. And I kind of agree with them. These are nice little hands. You can see that they're blued. They're actually blued to a purple color, which is part of the process of bluing hands is that they, they turn uh, like a yellow and then a purple and then a blue, and then they kind of turn black basically after enough time. And so when they heat blue these, they take these, these things and put them under a flame. Um, they really try to hit a certain color. And in this case, they went for purple. And I think it, I think it works. So hour and minute hand on, only one left here is the seconds hand. Okay, so we'll get that into place. And then after making sure that it's secured, we can start putting the movement back into the case and see how it looks as a finished product. Also, you have, always have to make sure that the hands aren't obstructed by anything at this point, including the other hands. That's actually enough to stop the watch itself. And uh, it's one of the places to look if your watch is stopping. Okay, so the crystal goes back in. And I can put this movement ring around the movement with the dial on it. Make sure that everything is dust free. This is of course the type of thing that will drive you absolutely nuts if you notice some dust or a smudge afterwards. So you've got to be careful. Put the movement case back on, gently flip it over. And I can pin down the ends of the bumper springs before putting on the uh, the actual bumper rotor itself. I see that the watch is happily running away, so I'm, I'm definitely thrilled to see that, especially that it's running quite well, given its age. So here's the bumper going in. This is gonna take a couple of screws to secure down, and then we just need to make sure that it's actually working that the bumper will A, swing freely, and B, is actually winding the watch. So let's take a look, yes, and you can see it's engaging with the wheel. Now you can also notice it only winds in one direction, but that's just how this one works. And there we go, it's actually winding up the watch. So that's exactly what we wanted to see. And I can put the watch case, or the watch back on it, the case back. And we can get a look at how this thing looks. And look at that. <laughs> how nice is that? A huge improvement over when we first got it. No doubt about it. This thing was in really tough shape when we got it. And now it actually looks pretty sweet. A nice little salmon dial on it too. I can do a quick measurement of the lugs and see if I have a, a watch strap that might work. And, and I do, it does need a couple of, uh, of spring bars here as well. But I found, I, I don't know if it really fits the watch, but I, I found a, a gray NATO strap that I thought might look good with it. So we'll throw that on it. I mean, really it's gonna be up to the owner to decide what type of strap he'd like to have on, on the watch. But uh, I like to throw something on there just so we can see what it might look like out in the wild. Yeah, 
And you can see there's actually some damage to the lug. And so th this is going to be the type of watch that you might wear occasionally, but is really better left in the kind of to be enjoyed. But take a look at it. It actually looks pretty cool on the NATO and uh, seems to be running well. And boy, does it look a lot better. I'm actually really happy with how that dial came out primarily. Now, I mentioned before that this watch had an issue where it would stop. So it did that again. Uh, so I wore it around uh, just as a test. And sure enough, after some amount of time, it would stop. So watch, I'm going to put this in fast motion here. And as you can see, it's running totally fine. It's cruising right along and everything looks great. But as I repeatedly noticed, it would stop. And this is exactly what would happen. It just would be ticking along and then it would say, mm, I think I'm done now. And it would stop. So I did a bunch of research and diagnosed the problem and I found that the cannon pinion is too tight and that actually can stop the entire watch. Now the tricky bit here <laughs> is how do you make the cannon pinion looser? It's one thing to tighten it down, but it's actually kind of a totally different thing to make it more loose. Basically, the recommendation is to buy a new one because it'll be uh, at the factory spec. But we don't have that option for this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use the reamer tool from my staking set to kind of open up the hole in the cannon pinion. And while there's no perfect science to this, I basically need to hand do this so that I take away the least amount of material possible. Too much kind of ruins it. So you just have to go a little bit at a time and get in there with this reamer tool to, to just open up that hole a tiny bit. And you know what? I was able to do so and it worked. I had the watch on for two days straight with no issues. It ran perfectly well, didn't stop at all. And as you can see, it came out beautifully. What a cool little family heirloom. And I really hope that my friend can enjoy the watch and maybe even have his family reminded of his grandma because, you know, at the end of the day, these little watches, one of the coolest things about them is that they can remind you of people that you love. And, uh, you know, that's what it all comes down to at the end of the day. Hey, I want to say thank you for joining me for this journey with this Turno bumper movement watch. It was really fun to restore and uh, I'm really glad you came along with me. Uh, if you'd like to check out my Instagram, it's wristwatch underscore revival. And you can go over there and uh, I post pictures from my collection and, and project updates and stuff like that. I'd love to say hi. So make sure you check that out. Thanks again for hanging out with me and we'll see you on the next one.